Glacier is a great place. In fact, it's my favorite place. And because it's so big, you're going to want to stay close to where you want to play. Because you now need a vehicle registration ticket to enter each area of the park, at least during peak hours of the summer season. I did a whole video on this subject, and it's on my channel. And if you're going to the park, you should probably check it out. For now, I'll just say that these tickets are hard to come by, and it may not be possible to drive from one area of the park into another, or even across the Going to the Sun Road. You should also read the information on the park's website. I've been to the park nearly every year since 1994, so I understand the choices pretty well. I'll cover everything from campgrounds, to cabins, to the motels and motor inns, and of course, the historic lodges. I'll even tell you about the backcountry chalets. About three million people visit the park every year. They come for the spectacular scenery, the wildlife, and perhaps the chance to experience the early 1900s version of luxury. The largest hotels are historic beauties built by the Great Northern Railroad. They have floors that creak, walls that are thin, no TVs, and beautiful lobbies with very slow Wi-Fi. The park is so remote that they're only open for about 110 days a year. To stay in the park, you have to plan ahead. There's less than a thousand rooms in the park, and they're often booked months in advance. So most of us don't get to stay in the park. There are many campgrounds, and a few of them take reservations which are also booked months in advance. Local businesses on the west side of the park have responded with accommodations at many price levels. From the traditional full-service hotel to my favorite motel, which is just a few miles from the west entrance. Glacier National Park was created in 1910, thanks in part to the Great Northern Railroad who brought the tourists here. They arrived at either East or West Glacier. They toured the park on horseback, and at the end of each day's ride, they stayed in tents or small chalets built by the railroad. It wasn't long before those accommodations weren't posh enough for the wealthy Easterners who could afford these trips. So the Great Northern started building large, modern hotels in spectacular places. These hotels are much the same today as they were when they were built. Some have been recently renovated, but they're still pretty basic by today's standards. If you're expecting to find features and amenities that you would find at any major city hotel costing this much, well, you're going to be disappointed. Here there is no air conditioning and few other modern conveniences that isolate you from the wonder that surrounds you. Wi-Fi is available, but only in the lobbies. You should also expect your cell phone not to work, unless you're in Apgar or near St. Mary. The historic lodges are located in the most popular parts of the park. And remember I said that Glacier is big. Well, these lodges are at least 50 miles apart and it'll take over an hour to get from one to another. I'm going to start at the beginning, which is a pretty good place to start. You can still arrive by train at East Glacier. Red buses provide tours and there's a shuttle bus service to the rest of the park. Glacier Park Lodge was completed in 1913 with 61 rooms. An annex was later built with another 100 rooms. This is the only lodge outside the park boundary, which is why it's legal to fly the drone here. The entire east side of the park is on Blackfeet tribal land. When the locals saw the lobby for the first time, they called it Big Tree Lodge because it's supported by 60 large trees that still retain their bark, which apparently is hard to do. There's also a fancy-ish restaurant and a bar lounge with more casual fare. And of course, there's a gift shop. The lobby also has a display that teaches the history of the area, as well as some local art. It's also a great place just to kick back and relax. There's a variety of rooms at different price points. This is one of the bigger ones. It has been recently renovated, it's comfortable, and it reflects the local environment. And there's a great view of the mountains. The smaller rooms are nice too. And I wonder why the hallway is so big. Back in the day, this was a destination hotel. So there's a nine hole golf course. And of course, you can tour the park on a red bus. You can also book a walking interpretive tour of this historic lodge. And if you want to get married here, they do that. It's become a popular wedding venue, and they got three ballrooms. The drive to Two Medicine, which is in the park, 
and takes a 15-minute drive through the town of East Glacier. We go past the golf course and then onto a high, twisty road that's actually a lovely drive. And you need to know that starting July 1st, 2023, you need a vehicle reservation ticket as well as a park pass to drive into Two Madison. They're doing this because the summer months, well, it was just getting too crowded. But if you're staying in the East Glacier Lodge, you also get a vehicle reservation ticket for Two Madison for the days that you're going to be staying there. But check the website because things tend to change. This is the Two Medicine Gate. In June, I didn't need a vehicle reservation. When the Sun Road is not fully open, this corner of the park tends to be pretty busy. Just about a mile past the gate, I tried to park at a trailhead. But even on an early June day, I had to double park just to get this shot of the trail. The main Two Medicine parking area is a couple no. more minutes down the road, near please Two Medicine Lake. The parking place, please. The parking lot's full up. Already, here too, on this cold, rainy day, the main lot was full, and it was just after 10 in the morning. But luckily, the camp store lot wasn't full. The camp store provides services for the campground nearby, which has about 100 sites. The sites here are available on a first-come, first-serve basis. This lack of parking means that the trails here are less crowded than others in the park, which is a good thing, because some of the most scenic trails in the park are here. Like the one to Scenic Point. It's a part of the Continental Divide Trail. Experienced hikers will tell you that the best multi-day hikes in the park are here too. And another can be combined with a boat ride, like the one to Twin Falls. And if you're not a hiker, the boat tours are great for you too. And on a nice day, so is this view from the bench. And the little town of East Glacier is one of the few towns on the east side that has a few motels. They're small, family-owned, and generally more affordable than the lodge. The town also has a few places to eat. And 20 minutes further into the Blackfeet Nation is the larger town of Browning. And I had a bad experience there once. I stopped for gas and was surrounded by locals demanding money. And well, I haven't been back. And in August of 2022, a commenter on one of my other Glacier videos said someone threw a rock, hitting his car while he was driving here on US-2. Anyway, our next destination is 50 miles north, on Highway 89, just outside the park. It's a scenic hour-plus drive that weaves its way through rolling prairie. At about the halfway point, there's some construction. In my last version of this video, I mentioned that the Blackfeet might take a page from the Navajo Business Development Handbook and build a much-needed large hotel on the east side of the park. And I can't help but wonder if that's just what they're doing. A little further up the road, there's a big 180 degree turn and a pullout. This is where my cell phone with AT&T service comes to life. On the northeast side of the park, this may be the only place where you have cell service. The town of St. Mary is the eastern terminus of the Going to the Sun Road. It's the home of the St. Mary Village. It's outside the park and offers many types of rooms and even pricey mini houses. If you need air conditioning, many of their rooms have it. There's also one gas station, though it is a dollar more than what I paid on the west side. When the Sun Road is open, they also open a little eatery next door. They make a pretty good buffalo burger and have a real good ice cream counter. A little farther north is my favorite part of the park, Mini Glacier. It's popular for a reason. It's a day hiker's paradise. And it's a pretty good place to spot wildlife, too. Many of the most popular trails in the park are here. Check out my other videos on the park for more info. Like Two Medicine, on July 1st, 2023, between 6 a.m. and 3 p.m., you'll need a vehicle reservation ticket just to enter. I have a whole segment on how to get those near the end of this video. So if you want to hike here, it's best to stay here. This is the Many Glacier Hotel. The five-story Swiss-style hotel opened in 1915. The surrounding mountains reminded many of the Alps, so the lodge was built in the Alpine Swiss style. The Great Northern Railway promoted it as one of the most noteworthy tourist hotels ever erected in America. Located on Swift Current Lake, the Mini Glacier Hotel is the largest in the park, with 214 guest rooms. In keeping with the era in which it was built, the rooms are simple but comfortable, and the ones with the balcony have a great view. 
And for you young couples, keep in mind that the walls are very thin. Like the other historic hotels, it does not have the luxury of air conditioning. It was renovated 100 years later, in 2016. The lobby is a great place to relax, near the large windows or the large fireplace. And feeding it keeps the bellman busy. During the 2016 renovation, the lobby was returned to its original design. The gift shop that had been added was removed. And in its place, they built a spectacular wood staircase to match the one that was originally here in 1915. The Park Service raised almost $250,000 to remake this solid wood double spiral staircase. It was a part of the original building in 1915, but in 1957 it was removed to make room for a gift shop. While talking to a bellman, I learned that the lights hanging from the lobby ceiling were changed back too. It also turns out that he's a subscriber to my channel and quite a fan. So I'm going to let him explain what they did. Uh, so the lighting that we have here after the renovations went back to the original Japanese style. The Great Northern Railway, when they had their line come through, it went Chicago to Seattle. And then they had a steamboat that could take you straight to Japan. So they bought lanterns from Kyoto, Japan. And But after World War II, Japanese style obviously wasn't very popular. So in the renovations, when they took out the spiral staircase, they also changed the lanterns. So in these most recent ones, they took them back to the original style for as much as they could. Let me tell you, it's really nice to hear from people who like my work. And you never know what kind of effect you're going to have on people. This guy was also working at the hotel, and he told me that he decided to work here after watching my hike to the Tarbigan Tunnel video, which is a pretty nice hike, and he wanted to see it for himself. The gift shop is now on the lower level. There's also a snack bar slash convenience store called Heidi's down there. Those supply shortages kept the shelves pretty empty on my last visit. The lower level also provides access to the rocky Swift Current Lakeshore. And even when the weather is bad, the view isn't. When it's good, it's really good. Especially at dawn. And the sunsets, they're not bad either. On the main floor, there's a fine dining restaurant. Here's a peek at the menu. The choices look pretty good. The fancy Tarbigan dining room has also been returned to its original glory. There's more affordable fare at the bar, usually. In June of 22, for some reason, they didn't have any, though the TV still worked. Lots of folks want to stay here so they can charge a lot for the privilege. This is a screenshot I made in August of 22 when I tried to book a room for August of 2023. There were only a few nights when rooms were available in the entire month. And that's one year out. In February of 2023, I again checked the website for the company that books the historic lodges that are inside the park. There were only two rooms available in any of them after July 1st. Now, there will be cancellations, but it's kind of hard to predict those. This is their September calendar. Note the early closing dates on some of the hotels. Then I looked at June. Several rooms were still available. But remember that the Sun Road and many of the trails are likely not to be open. Last year, the Sun Road didn't open until mid-July. I went to the park in June of 2022. I stayed in my favorite motel that's a few miles west of the park. It was cold and rainy a lot of the time, but I got to go to my favorite park. So I'm now a fan of going to the park in the off season. Then I checked a company that books the lodges that are just outside the park. Their website doesn't show you the availability for an entire month, so it was hard to check around. But I clicked around, but I did find that there were some rooms available in the busy summer season. But if you want to stay here, it just shows you that you have to plan ahead. Maybe more than a year ahead. If you're not lucky enough to stay here, and you can find a parking space, the Mini Glacier Hotel is worth a visit. But there's one more obstacle. The parking lot is higher than the top of the five-story hotel. The view from up here is pretty good, but remember you have to get back up it. I counted 55 steps, plus this little slope. So if you're staying here, you might want to load and unload your car down at door level. If you don't need the big lobby and you're really here just for hiking, you may want to stay about a mile down the road at the Swift Current Motor Inn and Cabins. This is my favorite place to stay. 
The Motor Inn's rooms are larger than the standard rooms in the hotel, and you can park near your door, which makes for an easy load in and load out for me. And many trailheads are literally just a few feet away. And the rooms here fill up quickly, and it's been years since I've been able to book a room here. You'd think they might comp be one for giving him so much business, but anyway. I've also stayed in the cabin several times, and they are very basic. Most have just one bed, and some don't even have a bathroom or hot water. They might be too basic for you, so be sure to ask for what they include. For example, is there hot water? There are some two-bedroom cabins, and they do have bathrooms and hot water. But when you're here to do some hiking, what more do you really need? Public bathrooms and showers are just a few yards away, near the public laundry. There's another little building here they call the Motel Pine Top. It has small rooms and thin walls. When I stayed here, I got bed bugs. But I'm sure they solved that problem by now. Across the parking lot is the Mini Glacier Campground. It's one of the most popular in the park. 40 of the 103 sites can be reserved at recreation.gov. The rest are first come, first serve. And both RVs and tents are allowed. Unless there's a lot of bear activity. Then only hard-sided campers are allowed. The lobby of the Motor Inn is functional. It adjoins a diner. After a name change, it's now called Nell's. It's moderately priced and reasonably tasty. I've eaten here a lot, and for me, it's pretty good hiking fuel. And pizza is a popular item, though picky people may not find gluten-free crust. The camp store is opposite the diner. It's well equipped with reasonably priced sandwiches and other packaged food, and also has some supplies, like bear spray. But more importantly, they have huckleberry soft serve ice cream. Even if you're not a hiker, there's much to do in Many Glacier. You can take a trail ride to Cracker Lake. It's the bluest in the park. Every night in the Swift Current parking lot, there's a wildlife spotting party. A ranger points a spotting scope to the slopes on either side of the valley. This is a great way to see bears safely from a distance. This is as close as my 600 millimeter lens could get. If there aren't any bears, you might see bighorn sheep or mountain goats. Mountain goats are particularly fond of the ledges on the opposite slope. This is also a great place to see wildlife without a scope. If you're coming here to see bears, this is one place to see them. The Iceberg Lake Trail is often closed because of too much bear activity, and moose are common in a nearby lake. And I was once lucky enough to see a porcupine. The lake the moose feed in is Fisher Cap Lake. It's just a short walk from the Swift Current Lobby down this path. The moose go to the lake to feed, and they tend to do so most evenings around dinner time. But it's important to remember that this is not Disneyland. Sometimes we encounter bears on their search for berries. It's important to remember that this is the wildlife's home. We are the intruders. If you want to see what happens with a mama bear and her cubs around a trail, watch the Iceberg Lake segment of my long hiker video on my channel. We were lucky. On my first visit to the park, a man on the same trail wasn't. He was badly mauled. At the end of the parking lot, near the campground, there are informative ranger programs. I've heard many of these and, well, they're always interesting. And, uh, oh yeah, the, the rangers also give talks in the Mini Glacier Hotel, often with a slideshow. During the day, there are boat tours on Swift Current Lake and nearby Lake Josephine. Canoes and kayaks can be rented, but if you bring your own, it has to be inspected for zebra mussels before you can put it in the water. Don't be responsible for contaminating this pristine water. If photography is your thing, then you gotta love Mini Glacier. Sunrise in front of the Mini Glacier Hotel is one of the best you will ever see. And seeing things like this is one of the best reasons to stay in the park. I tuck all of these images in Many Glacier. The park's other historic lodge is on the busier west side of the park. It's at the eastern end of the largest lake in the park, Lake McDonald. Lake McDonald Lodge is also in the Swiss style, but it wasn't built by the Great Northern. 
It was built by a local to compete with the Great Northern's East Side Hotels. Its three and a half stories were finished in 1914 as the Lewis Glacier Hotel. In 1957, the name was changed. Out back, there are 18 rentable cottages with a lake view. The real entrance, well, the original entrance, is on the lakeside. The first visitors got here by boat because the road wasn't built yet. And that explains why this entry is so small. It's really the back door. The lobby is smaller than the others, but it's still a nice space. A large fireplace covers one wall. The lodge has only 82 rooms, but there are those 18 cottages. In a short distance away, there's also a motor inn. Like the others, this can be a pretty pricey place to stay, and the restaurant caters to those who can afford to stay here. There's also a bar with a few food items. I've never stayed here, mostly because there aren't any trails just outside the door. But it's another place where you are able to get on a horse and do a trail ride. This is more of a place for the tour bus crowd. If you're not going to do any hiking, this just might be the best place to stay. Well, that's all of Glacier's historic hotels and a couple of their nearby motor inns. There are two more motor inns. They're at either end of the Going to the Sun Road. The Apgar Village Inn is on the west side and Rising Sun is on the east. We're going to start 10 miles west of the Lake McDonald Lodge, where a few buildings make up the town site of Apgar. The Apgar Village Inn is on the west shore of Lake McDonald. It's the only place where you can get a room this close to a lake. Another advantage to staying here is that you're in a little walkable town with shops, cafes, and other services. You can rent a kayak, an e-bike, or even a can of bear spray here. You can also book a horseback ride or a rafting trip. And for the kids in nearby West Glacier, you'll find a hatchet and matches store with a fine example of vertical integration because they sell first aid kits too. Did I say that with enough sarcasm? Anyway, the small town feel is probably one reason the Apgar Village Inn is already fully booked for most of 2023. Of course, it can also be because this is the view from the rooms. And they have little kitchens too, so you can save money on meals. The Apgar Village Inn has a lot to offer, but to stay here, you have to plan way in advance. You'll have to grab one of the rooms as soon as they are released on the website. There's also a campground. It's the largest in the park, and one of only five that take reservations. And the only way to book them is on the recreation.gov website. The campground has trees that provide tent and RV campers with shade and some privacy. There's potable water, flush toilets, and showers. On most evenings, you can take a short walk to the amphitheater to take an arranger talk. And now, let's talk about the sunsets. A lucky few get to see them from their door. The rest of us are lucky enough to see them from the lake shore. It's one of those rare communal moments when everybody just stares in silence. A little later, it's a great place to stargaze. Yes, that's the Milky Way. And if you're really lucky, you may even see the Northern Lights. If possible, the pre-dawn and sunrise is even better. Now it's time to wrap up the Apgar section and head over to our last motor inn, Rising Sun. The Rising Sun Motor Inn is four miles from the east entrance of the Going to the Sun Road. It's very close to St. Mary Lake, which is very nice in the morning. There's a reason they call it Rising Sun. The way the light hits the mountains here is spectacular. You can also take a boat tour on St. Mary Lake. The ticket office is just down the hill. The rooms and cabins are similar to those found at Swift Current. They are simple, basic, and comfortable. The cabins are tucked away in the woods and they're a step up from those at Swift Current. There's also a camp store and a restaurant. And by the way, I've stayed in all of these rooms and they've every place I've mentioned so far. This is another great place for photography. It's where the prairie meets the mountains and where elk graze in the morning. And Wild Goose Island is just up the road. It's an amazing spot. 
A little further down the road are trailheads to several waterfalls. So when you're looking for an adventure near the Going to the Sun Road on the east side of the park, consider the Rising Sun Motor Inn. I like to visit the park around Labor Day, but late in the year, forest fires are much more likely to affect your trip. In 2015, 17, and 18, fires canceled my trips. The one in 2018 was really bad. Several cabins and privately owned residents around the eastern shore of Lake McDonald were destroyed, and the Lake McDonald Lodge was closed for the season. Fires don't have to be in the park to cause a problem. Several of my trips have been affected by smoke from fires that were hundreds of miles away. In early October of 2020, this was my view of Lake McDonald. Luckily, the wind direction changed the next day, but smoke still obscured the scenery. So my pictures were not as pretty as usual. Before I tell you about the backcountry chalets, I need to mention the classic hotel that's in Glacier's sister park, Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park. In 1932, these parks were united to form the first International Peace Park. It's here where the Great Northern built the Prince of Wales Hotel in a pretty good spot. As the name suggests, the hotel features British charm, with a high tea served daily. The hotel overlooks the town site of Waterton. There are a number of other hotels and tourist services in the town. The lake straddles the U.S. and Canada border. A cruise can take you to trailheads along the shore, and to the U.S. side's tiny outpost called Goat Haunt, if it's open. Other water activities are available on Lake Cameron, about 20 minutes away. Hikers have several options depending on your ability. The fittest should do the Crip Lake Trail. It's a tough one, but amazing. This old hotel has just 86 rooms, so only the privileged few get to stay here, but all of us get to enjoy the view. At the opposite end of the comfort spectrum, you can reserve backcountry camping permits throughout Glacier National Park. You'll have to pack out what you pack in, and you'll have to secure your food from bears. But there is an easier way to stay in the backcountry. Remember I said early visitors stayed in chalets throughout the park? Well, two of them are still around. Granite Park Chalet is in a notch below Swift Current Pass. The only way to get there is to hike. The easiest way starts seven miles away at Logan Pass. You have to bring your own bedding and you don't know who else is going to be in the bunkhouse with you, but it is drier than a tent. The other chalet has been recently resurrected. The original Sperry Chalet was gutted by a forest fire in 2017. It was rebuilt with the help of donations in time to accept visitors in 2021. The Sperry Chalet offers more conventional rooms and meals compared to Granite Chalet and you can, it's located in the Lake McDonald area. You can only get there on foot, your own, or on the hoof, if you book early enough. The trail starts out in the trees, but then there are a number of switchbacks. It's a long, tough hike to the new Sperry Chalet, which is perched in a clearing with a great view of the McDonald Valley. It's very difficult to get reservations for the 17 rooms, for 2023, they became available on the 1st of February. I forgot this fact, and I didn't check until about 5 o'clock. By the time I did, they were all gone for the entire year. But I'll try again next year. Like I said, I prefer to stay in the park, but these days, there just aren't enough rooms. They have to be booked months in advance, and, well, they're just too pricey. At least the big lodges are. Some of the rooms are $650 a night. And that's a little bit too rich for me. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who can't afford that. So most of the three million annual visitors stay outside the park. This can be a challenge and pricey too, especially during the busy season. There are lots of places to stay in the towns west of the park, including on the high end. But there are also RV and tent campgrounds. And there are a few places in the middle that are perfect for me. But before we talk about my favorite place, the Mini Golden, let's talk about the east side. The Blackfeet controlled east side doesn't have a lot of accommodations. There are a few small places near the St. Mary's Resort, one near Bab, and another near Duck Lake. There are a few places in East Glacier too, but not many. So until whatever this is going to be is built, there aren't many options on the east side. The closest airport to the park is about an hour west 
in the town of Kalispell. There are lots of hotels and restaurants there. Further south is the Flathead Lake Tourist Area. It's the largest natural lake west of the Mississippi. And don't worry, this was shot in early June before things were ramping up for the season. Closer to the park, there's the towns of Whitefish and Columbia Falls. But my favorite place to stay on the west side is the Mini Golden Motel in Hungry Horse. It's just a few miles from the park's west entrance. I found it by searching Google Maps. I don't use booking sites because they take 10 to 20% of the take away from the small business. Because I have so much equipment, I prefer to stay on the first floor of places where I can back right up to my room door. It makes unloading and loading much easier. And there's an added bonus when there's no second floor. That makes the Mini Golden the perfect place for me. And besides, I like to support small businesses. The Mini Golden was built by a retired Navy man who was paralyzed by a drunk driver while on active duty. Today, it's managed by his daughter. Sadly, your handsome Malamute passed away recently. But yes, your dog is welcome too. The veteran designed nine of the rooms to be wheelchair friendly. And for security, they even have a peephole at wheelchair height. This is one of the wheelchair friendly rooms. As you can see, it's big. It has a kitchenette, a nice sized fridge, and a dining table. And this really big bathroom. A wheelchair can actually roll right into the shower. It's in a handy location too. There's a grocery store right across the street, which made it easy to get provisions for my days in the park and to cook my own meals when I got back to the room. This was a great place for this minor filmmaker, but it was also good enough for international movie star Ewan McGregor. He stayed here while shooting a motorcycle road trip show. By the way, even the standard rooms are quite big and have two beds. I stayed for five nights, which gave me an idea of how most people experience the park. After a long day exploring and hiking, it was nice to return to a large temperature controlled room with a fridge and a stove and working Wi-Fi. It turns out there are advantages to staying outside the park. And I'll be back to the Mini Golden. Well, that's about all I've got to say about the amazing lodges in Glacier National Park. Staying in them is a special experience. They're in great locations making it easy to get on the trails. But it's hard to book a room, and frankly, they're getting too expensive for many. But if you can't get a room in the park, that shouldn't discourage you from going to Glacier. There are plenty of options just outside the park boundary, and I'm surprised to say, well, there's some advantages to staying off site. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video and even found it helpful. If you can plan your trip up to a year in advance, staying in the park is a great option. But if you can't, or if you just need a last minute getaway, there are plenty of options outside the park. But remember, you'll need a vehicle reservation ticket to get in the park. There are a couple of ways to get those. They're released in advance, but they go quickly. And they also release a certain number of tickets 24 hours in advance at 8 a.m. each morning. Remember, you got to sign in first to reservation.gov, then right at 8 a.m., try to get your ticket. And time will tell, but hopefully this reservation system will keep the crowds and traffic to a minimum so we can all enjoy the trails and magnificent scenery of Glacier.